This is animation. This is also animation. Ah, uh, Wingardium Leviosa. What are you, out of your mind? No, you're not, Mucky! You're a fool! You're a fool like everyone else, Mucky! Do you seek revenge for your brother's death? Somebody killed Daryl? Yeah, that's also animation. But this? This is animation. Disney, yes, nature, <laughs> Disney, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So I've been wanting to make animation tutorials for a while now, but I've been afraid to start because I feel like I'm not qualified. And then I remember that this is YouTube and there's tons of unqualified people that make tons of videos. So that's bullshit. Anyways, I've been trying to think of where to start because there's more to making animation than just making things move. Although that is very important. I began thinking back to things that really held me back when I was younger and trying to get into animation. And that's when I remembered this. <laughs> While all that is visually and technically impressive, I do think it sets up a very unrealistic and unfair idea of what an animator is or isn't when you first start getting into animation. I vividly remember that when I was in high school, I would think if I don't do this, Sakuga, then I'm not an animator. I don't really make real animation, I'm a joke. I thought everything else was low effort bullshit that didn't require any skill, hand drawn was the pinnacle of animation. What any pleb really thinks, right? That's just some normie bullshit. I was just watching 2D and anime exclusively and basically creaming in my jeans. I wasn't considering anything else true animation. And in doing so, I was insulting other animators and even what animation is. Because animation just isn't one thing done one way. It's one thing done many ways, an infinite number of ways. It's a dense ocean with its own ecosystem that we all love. And if you can't understand that or appreciate that, I think that will really hold you back as an artist animator as in a person, right? There is no king of the sea. It's all simply part of the ecosystem. Contrary to what you may see on every platform, animation isn't a genre. Anime isn't a genre. They're all just animation. They're all a style of animation, but it is not its own genre. It is just another medium through which to tell a story with. And honestly, after experimenting with different types of animation, not only was it very humbling, but it also made me realize one other thing. This shit is all hard. It sucks. It all takes forever. It's just a matter of how you want to die. Do you want to drown? Do you want to burn to death? Do you want to get shot in the head? Do you want to die by thick thighs? It's all suffering. And that's okay. So how exactly does one appreciate animation? You watch it, but you watch all of it, and you respect it. What does that mean? That means that if you watch someone animate a whole film with wood chips, you leave a comment that says, this is very cool. Not, this is very cool, but 2D is still the very hardest type of animation. Shut the fuck up. It's all hard. Show them respect. Understand why this is beautiful, not why something is better than that. Appreciate is defined as to grasp the nature, worth, quality, or significance of. So that means you're just taking in what makes this important. Appreciation doesn't necessarily mean liking something. It definitely helps like something, of course. But just because I appreciate something doesn't necessarily mean I enjoy it, right? I don't like eating carrots, but I do appreciate the health benefits it gives me. I don't like dubstep or country, but I do appreciate the work it takes to achieve that sound within production and writing the music. I can't really like you guys because I don't know you, but I do appreciate you for watching the video. I'm kidding, I love you guys. A key part to appreciating animation and animating in general is understanding intent. Everything in animation is done with intent, including how something is animated. Sometimes that intent is to help solidify the motif of their project. Sometimes that intent is because lack of resources, forcing the art to get more creative in how to evoke the emotion they want the viewer to experience when they see their animation. Sometimes it's simply to experiment with how to make something look alive. It doesn't have to have a plot. It's just simply about the motion. This is where we get to the point of the video. I can't really play these animated projects because A, I would get copyright stricken, 
B, it's kind of fucked up to take views from these projects. These people work very hard on and I would like them to get more exposure and views. They're so great and deserve so much love for what they are. And C would just make the video very fucking long. I'm going to recommend a project you watch, give my quick thoughts on it. I don't want to give too much because that's a lot of brain power and I don't want to use all that. Hopefully you watch it and we continue on through the list. We're going to start out with stop motion. That's when you take a bunch of pictures of an object and make it look like it's alive. Darkness, light, darkness. John Svenkmeyer, 1980s. Svenkmeyer does this very interesting thing where he makes these very cold and matter effect pieces. He always has these very kind of empty, boxed in backdrops. If it's like a house or a room, it's almost always just the object that's being animated. So it creates this very claustrophobic and lonely effect. But he also manages to make the films very kind of funny and whimsical in a way. I don't know how to describe it, but he just manages to add humanity to this very cold, bland, dark, matter-of-fact world. So now we're going to move into a little subsection of stop motion called pixelation, which is essentially stop motion but done with a human model. That is actually so much harder than using an inanimate object because humans don't really stay still. Luminaris, Juan Pablo Zaramilla, 2011. I honestly don't understand how this film doesn't have hundreds of millions of views. It's beautifully shot, it's beautifully animated. It's so creative in how it makes these glassy and hard elements very gummy and poppy. The story's cute. There's so many jaw-dropping sequences that are just animated so well. I mean, I have nothing but good things to say about this film, really. Fresh Guacamole, Bess, 2012. This film is a wonderful example of how not everything needs a conventional plot to still be a beautiful piece. It's just a dude making guac. Analog traditional animation. So basically 2D using paper or cells or any form of thing you can hold. Wildlife. Amanda Forbes and Wendy Tilby, 2012. Cell animation using gouache. Honestly, it was tough choosing between this and When the Day Breaks. Both are great films. I would still recommend watching When the Day Breaks, but I really like this one. It reminds me kind of like a quippy Wes Anderson type film. On top of being very funny at the use of the gouache and the art style of the film, it kind of reminds me of like a neo-impressionistic painting almost. So it definitely helps add to the fact that the film takes place in the early 1900s. Walking, Ryan Larkin, 1968, Multimedia. I fucking love this film. It is so good on so many levels to me. It captures the beauty of movement so well, especially with something that says so much about a person, how they walk. The film manages to catch so many different characters and personalities with water splotches to ink drawings. Artistically, it's phenomenal. And technically, once you start animating walk cycles and you realize how fucking hard they are, it is a fucking powerhouse. Rip Ryan Larkin, this man is the fucking master of personality within movement. Chair, Hiroshi Mori, 2000 pen and paper. All the films I've showed you so far all kind of have their own flair and bells and whistles, so separate them apart from just your average animation. But what separates this one from the other films is actually just the simplicity of it. It's just ink on paper. It's just straight fundamentals. There's flow, there's depth, there's weight, there's gravity. There's a round object against a square object with lines against it. Just literally the most bare bones basic animation and it's wonderful. All right, now I want to get into digital slash computer animation. Hunger, Peter Folds, 1974, animated using raster and interpolation. This film was made during the 70s using interpolation. If that sounds familiar to anyone, that's actually the same technology being used to bump up 24 FPS animation to 60 FPS. So the technology actually isn't anything new, and it still does the same thing it did in the 70s. It simply transitions one image to the next image using the most optimal and minimal amount of effort. Hence why you get all the weird blocks and artifacts. While I have seen some uses for interpolation in some TV animations and stuff like that, I still don't think interpolation will ever be the auto-animate button that a bunch of people are praising it to be or hoping it can be. So to anyone saying interpolation and 60fps animation is the future and the technology still being figured out, no, it's not. The computer doesn't add any weight, it doesn't understand what gravity is, it simply just inserts frame with the least amount of work possible. It is truly the laziest way to animate. With all that in mind, this film uses the interpolation to create this like distorted morphing style to its benefit to make this almost frightening, anxiety-driven piece about indulgence in all its forms. This film is the one time I will support 60 FPS animation if they use it as an example of what interpolation can do. <laughs> it's horrifying, but it's wonderful. Ryan, Chris Landreth, 2005. So do you remember that film Walking? Well, the director of that film was thought to have great things ahead of him. But then out of nowhere, he just vanished. 
like the Avatar. Two years later, Chris Landreth, the director of this film, spotted Ryan begging for money on the streets. I have a soft spot for documentary and mockumentary style of animation because interviews are such a drab, they are what they are type of thing. So when an animator uses animation to kind of help embellish the interview or even add some more character to the interview, I think it's a really cool thing. Chris does a wonderful job of displaying broken people within the film and how much of an inspiring figure Ryan is to him, but also how much of a shell of a man he is and what his vices are. I think it's a very powerful piece, and even though it is kind of a bummer, I think it does do a great job of showing that not everyone will ever be completely put together. Everyone has their damage and their pieces that are gone from them, even someone as talented as Ryan Larkin or as Chris. Define Intervention Paper Bag Animator 2016 When I think of YouTube Flash animation, I typically think of parodies, very loud noises, <coughs> and things happening. I'm kidding. And there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, I think it's very funny. But Paper Bag Animator did something different and chose to use his powers for good. And Paper Bag Animator used like all these popular techniques to make a very cohesive and powerful story about someone losing their faith in themselves and what they think defines them. There's tons of popular voice actors. It's animated beautifully. It's presented very well. He also has another piece called Agony Ant that I love. It's so awesome. Definitely reminiscent of Gynex and Trigger stuff. Their Studio Mila channel is amazing. They're putting out great work. I would definitely recommend following them and I hope they take off. They're so cool. All right, closing thoughts. The point of this video isn't to make you a pretentious dickhead that loves indie animation like me. I would be lying if I said every animated piece has a deeper meaning. You really think I'm gonna sit here and say Michael Cusack's Shucker in the Mute is just as thematically dense as something like a Brothers Koi film? Of course not, what are you fucking crazy? But it doesn't have to be, nor doesn't even want to be as thematically dense as that. And that's exactly why appreciating animation is such an important foundation to being an animator is it helps you recognize what separates this from that, but also recognize nothing is better than the other. They are relevant in their own way and understanding that will help you understand your place within the ecosystem. Even when first beginning, of course you're not going to be cheering out something like that and that's okay. That doesn't make your piece any more or less relevant or should stop you from working on something. You have to start some and you have to appreciate where you start from. And that's why for me, having an appreciation for animation and understanding what that means is so important to being an animator. I hope this all made sense and is cohesive. Thank you so much for watching and I already have a ton of other videos planned, but if you would like me to talk about something else, please let me know in the comments below. Um, thank you so much for watching guys, really.